Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video that claims to be providing irrefutable evidence for God in two minutes. Ordinarily this is the kind of video that I would tend to avoid, but realistically if an all-powerful creator god exists, and this god wants us to believe in him, a two minute YouTube video inspired by this being should be more than adequate for those purposes, right? Also, given my upcoming at the time of this writing jury selection day, I needed something fairly short that wouldn't require a lot of in-depth researching, so here we are. Let's go! We know that every needle must have its craftsman and owner. If we specify sewing needles, maybe. But you can find naturally occurring needles all over the place, from what are essentially hypodermic needles found in stinging organisms, like bees, wasps, ants, some caterpillars, scorpions, and more, to the more innocuous needles found on coniferous trees, to the needles that were the inspiration behind Velcro found on plants that spread their seeds through the use of burrs that stick to people and animals as they brush up against them, and I haven't even scratched the surface, pun intended, of all the varieties of needles that can be found in nature. And as we know, every letter must be written by someone. Letters are just shapes. Here's a bunch of pictures taken of letter shapes found naturally occurring on butterfly wings, which you can actually order as a poster right now if you so desire. Now, I know that people advocating for a creator will just say that these needles and alphabet letters were actually designed by someone, that's how they ended up in nature, right? So this doesn't prove anything. But ultimately that's just a completely unfalsifiable claim. The creationist says that such and such can only exist because it was made by someone. I point out naturally occurring versions of such and such, and the creationist responds with, aha, that proves my point because the creator is the someone who made those versions of the such and suches. Call me when you have an actual testable claim. Otherwise it wouldn't make any sense, right? No, it makes perfect sense. I guess with the letters in order to be strung together coherently with meaning, they need a mind behind them? Well, sort of. I wonder what this guy thinks of the AI chatbots. He probably just ignores the emergent complexity that we're seeing in that space and hides behind the idea that those chatbots were created by people, so ultimately there is a mind behind them. But yeah, for the letters to have meaning requires minds, such as ours, in order to imbue them with meaning. But there's a significant difference between these shapes exist and these shapes mean certain things. Like, they have meaning because we give them meaning, not because there is inherent meaning there. Well, then how can it be that an extremely well-ordered human being has no ruler? What do rulers have to do with this? Do you mean the creator? Because extremely ordered isn't what we were discussing up until this point. The human body, well, it could be described as extremely ordered if you like, is also quite clearly the result of this order arising out of evolutionary processes that were not directed. If you think we were designed in our present form, then that designer made some very odd choices, like giving us a spine that would do better in a quadrupedal posture, giving us muscles to swivel our ears, which are not positioned in a way that is conducive to swiveling, while the muscles that are there to swivel them are too weak to do it anyway, putting in wisdom teeth which mostly just serve to cause problems and need to be removed before you grow up, knees that are basically guaranteed to break down at some point in your life, growing a tail during embryonic development that just gets reabsorbed, having a broken gene that, were it not broken, would allow us to produce our own vitamin C. And I could keep going. There are entire books that have been written about the bad design of the human body. All of these design problems make perfect sense given our evolutionary history, but if we were specially created in our present form, they are baffling to say the least. Some people are ignoring the miracle of creation. Some people would like to see evidence of creation rather than just taking you on your word about it. They claim that the human came into existence by atoms that came together. The way that was worded leads me to suspect that this statement is just a complete misunderstanding of the process of abiogenesis. But putting that aside, do you not believe that we're made of atoms? Because literally everything in the universe that is matter but is not subatomic is made of atoms. Your body is, quite literally, a collection of atoms that came together. And in addition to that, it's not even always the same atoms. The atoms that make up your body a decade from now will probably be mostly atoms that are not in your body today. Although, given the difficulty you seem to be having with the idea of emergent complexity, I'm concerned that the ship of Theseus idea will just break your brain. 
They also say that a human is only a speaking animal. Isn't this absurd? The word only there is a bit absurd, yes. There is a lot that we do as animals that distinguish us from the other animals. But we are indeed still animals. We are living organisms that feed on organic matter, have specialized sense organs, and a nervous system capable of responding rapidly to stimuli. That is the definition of an animal, so to say that we are not animals, you must show that one of these criteria does not apply. I suspect I know which one might not apply in your case. Was that mean? Nah. People who claim that don't even know which nonsense they have to accept with the denying of a creator. Nah, man, we just accept the evidence. We don't so much deny the existence of a creator as point out that there isn't any evidence that points exclusively to a creator, and should such evidence show up at some point, it likely wouldn't point to any specific creator. Though, I suppose if the creator is everything that you think he is, then he'd be able to provide that specific evidence no problem. But, spoiler for the end, this video is actually arguing in favor of the Muslim god rather than the Christian one, and yet, I see nothing in these arguments that would point to the Muslim god over the Christian one. And yeah, I know some of you are going to say that it's the same god because they're both based on the Jewish god, but the followers of these respective gods all give him different characteristics to a point where if you put all three of them in a room, you would be able to tell them apart fairly easily. So while I do acknowledge that they share a similar cultural history, the end result is distinct in each religion. So this is why we will ask you a few questions in order to make you think more in detail about this topic. Okay, but you said this video contained irrefutable evidence for God, not that it contained questions to make you think about the God topic. The human body consists of different parts, like our hands and feet, or inner organs. The head bones connected to the neck bone. The neck 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 bones connected to the neck bone, etc. Yeah, we're all made out of parts. Got it. How is it possible that the blind atoms can create hands, feet, and organs? It's called a gestalt, which is also the only German word that I usually don't get a bunch of Germans in my comments correcting my pronunciation on. Though, now that I've brought attention to it, there will probably be a few that do, because it's pretty much inevitable that I got it wrong, even if it is more subtle than my usual pronunciation mistakes. Anyway, gestalt. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's a pretty common phenomenon and requires no supernatural intervention whatsoever. Just think about it. Atoms don't possess any knowledge about life conditions. They don't have to. Atoms don't possess any knowledge about wetness, and yet a group of atoms together are capable of being wet. Just behaving in accordance with the laws of physics is enough for emergent complexity to be a thing. Now, who wrote those laws, you ask? Apparently no one. They aren't prescriptive laws where somebody wrote the laws and that determines how the universe will behave in order to obey those laws. Rather, they are descriptive laws where we observe how the universe behaves and then we work out the laws that describe our observations. But they should be able to create a human body that is viable. Really? Yes, really. Your incredulity at that fact is not evidence for God. The only thing it is evidence for is your incredulity at that fact. How can the atoms of the eye create an eye that is able to see the sun, while they are not able to see the sun themselves? Because the way atoms interact with each other makes that possible. Interactions between multiple things can sometimes change the nature or behavior of the original things. Table salt, for instance, is made up of a poison gas that will kill you painfully, and an explosively unstable metal. Mix those two things together, and you get table salt, which is actually necessary for your continued survival. In moderation, anyway. Good luck trying to get a salt deficiency nowadays. And if you want to get really pedantic, our eyes don't see the sun, or anything else for that matter. They are stimulated by photons into producing an electrical signal, which our brain then turns into an image that we quote-unquote see. Are you saying that your ear atoms have created your ears while they are not able to hear themselves? Ibid, but with hearing instead of seeing. And the atoms of the tongue cannot taste, but they create the tongue? Ibid but with taste instead of hearing or seeing. This whole thing is just the fallacy of composition, the idea that something is true of the whole on the grounds that it is also true of some of the parts of the whole. 
no atoms are alive, therefore nothing made out of atoms is alive, is literally the second example of the composition fallacy on the Wikipedia page, and that's exactly what you are doing here, except with specific abilities that we have rather than the general concept of life. An equivalent statement would be, your feet do not hear, therefore you cannot hear. It just doesn't follow. How should this all be possible? Come on, does it really make sense to you? Yes, it really does. To give a personal example, I don't like cinnamon. I think it's gross. So the composition fallacy would have me saying, I do not like apple pie because cinnamon is gross, and cinnamon is in apple pie. I do, however, like apple pie, despite the cinnamon. Because it's got a gestalt thing going on where all the flavors of the apple pie together are better than any one flavor from the apple pie if it were separated out. Or you could say that computers are impossible because electricity by itself cannot do math or work out logic gates. Starlings cannot murmurate because a single starling by itself has no concept of the overall movement of the other birds in the murmuration. Snowflakes cannot form because the water molecules don't know anything about any crystalline patterns or anything. I could go on there's example after example after example. Let's keep going. We all know that atoms no patterns, right? No, we don't know that. We literally arrange atoms on a table based on their various properties, which could be described as patterns. Then how are the atoms able to create organs which were designed so perfectly that you would think specific patterns were used for each one of them? Perfectly designed organs? I think the appendix would like a word with you. You do know that it's possible to make things that have properties that the individual parts of that thing do not have, right? Like, cars can travel at 100 kilometers per hour down the highway, even though a steering wheel by itself cannot. This is pretty basic stuff. The organs themselves are a miracle of creation. Yeah, they just frequently have issues that require human intervention. Hell, what is arguably the single most important organ in the body, the brain, is also one of the organs that is most consistently in need of intervention, with approximately one in four Americans taking prescription medication for their mental health, and that's just talking about it from a mental health perspective. It also just messes up all the time under perfectly normal operation. Like, when you remember something, you aren't remembering a recording of that past event. You are quite literally mentally recreating that event based on generalized cues that your brain has saved. And your brain has different priorities for different categories of cues. Like, for instance, it prioritizes things like how you felt during that event much higher than what was said at that event. And that's not even getting into just how easy it is for our brains to be tricked by our own cognitive biases, or problems with perception in general. The miracle of creation seems designed to cause problems. How can simple atoms place the organs at the perfect place in our bodies? Well, I would think natural selection would take care of that pretty well. If the organs show up in a place where they won't work, that organism won't survive. But also, are they in the perfect place? I got a pair of testicles dangling precariously outside of my body where they can be easily hurt that might argue otherwise. Also, with just normal variation in people, the organs can be in different locations inside their bodies, like there are people with their heart on the other side of their chest and stuff, so it, there's a lot of wiggle room with where they're placed. More than that, how can they even know the numbers of the organs that are essential for our bodies? More than that, why would they need to? Do you think every gear in every machine knows how many gears are needed for that machine to operate? Do you think every starling knows how many starlings are necessary to successfully murmurate? Does every water molecule have to know how many molecules are necessary to be a fluid? The parts of something don't need to have knowledge about how many of them are needed in order to be that thing. All these activities are only possible with specific attributes like an internal life, will, knowledge, and an internal might. How did you reach that conclusion? Even if I grant your ridiculous claim that atoms need to have knowledge in order to form humans, how does that even remotely point to their existing a being with eternal life, will, knowledge, and eternal might? And you give all these attributes to atoms which don't even possess one of them? Really? No, I don't give those attributes to atoms. I instead ask why you even think that they are necessary attributes in order for things made out of atoms to exist. It seems to me that all that would be necessary is for the universe to operate in accordance with the laws of physics that it appears to operate in accordance with. Okay, let's come to a conclusion. There are two options. Either you say that atoms are the owner of endless knowledge, will, and might, or you say that these atoms are the creation of God. 
Nope, those are not our two options. You haven't shown that eternal life, will, knowledge, and might are even necessary to the existence of stuff. Your whole video is just one composition fallacy after another. And that's it for this one, nice and short so I have time for <laughs> jury duty, but also that served another purpose. A semi-frequent criticism that I get is the question of why I focus so much on Christianity when there are other religions like Islam that spread similar messages that also have a proclivity for science denial. Well. Aside from the main reason of Christianity being something that I am intimately familiar with, and Islam being something that I would have to learn a lot about if I were to shift focus, there's also the fact that this video is pretty standard for the quality of apologetics that come out of Muslim organizations, at least as far as I've seen. And as much as this video might seem like it, this is not a video put out by some rinky-dink YouTuber with 200 subscribers who just does this as a hobby. This was put out by a dedicated organization called Towards Eternity, which started on YouTube just three months before I did, and they currently have almost five times the number of subscribers as I do. But subscribership itself doesn't really mean much on YouTube anymore. The important metric to look at is how many subscribers are actually watching the videos. And an easy way to get a rough idea of that is to divide a channel's total video views by how many videos they've uploaded, and then divide that number by how many subscribers they have. So that gives us an idea of how engaged their audience is. My number is 0.6. In this case, higher is better, with one basically meaning that all of your subscribers always watch your videos all the time. Their number is 0.42. It's low compared to mine, but when you look at a typical Christian apologist on YouTube, they typically score below 0.2, with even the flashy and well-known PragerU, which... I know Dennis Prager is Jewish, but that is basically Christian propaganda, but they only score 0.26. So the end result here is that it looks like I grabbed a video from the bottom of the barrel, but I really grabbed one from an apologetics organization that has a much greater impact on their particular community than most Christian apologetics organizations. And they did it with arguments that none of the Christian apologists that I've ever looked at would be caught dead making because they're just so embarrassingly and obviously fallacious. So that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Green Abbott, who says, I had to laugh at the lack of self-awareness of this channel accusing anyone else of having annoying too loud intro music. This was posted on a video where I warned headphone users of an annoying loud screeching sound that was used as part of the intro for the video I was responding to. Not music, just a high-pitched and obnoxious sound. Yeah, I do play some music at the beginning and end of my videos that some people probably don't like. Well, not probably. Musical tastes differ. A lot of you definitely don't like it. But it's unlikely to cause an actual physical pain response in the same way as the sound that I was actually warning people about. Now, that being said, things like this are incredibly subjective. I feel that I have my intro music, if anything, a bit on the quiet side in a better safe than sorry kind of way, but if you guys find it obnoxiously loud, I do want to know about that so I can adjust it. Typically, I normalize all the spoken audio tracks in my videos to negative 19 luffs, which, if you're not familiar, it's a unit of loudness that attempts to compensate for the fact that loudness is a fairly subjective objective experience, and perception of loudness can be dependent on factors other than just pure signal strength, which is what decibels measure. So the spoken tracks get normalized to negative 19 luffs, and my intro music is at negative 31 luffs. For reference, negative 24 is pretty typical for music, so if I normalize the music to what is typical, it would be quite a bit louder than it is now. All this to say that if you think it's too loud, let me know so that I can adjust it. If you do not think it's too loud, also let me know so that I can get a feel for which side is winning. Thanks for watching, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark Hetchum, Ashton Fall, Apui Retsam, Godless Granny, and all the rest, who are the atoms that make up the body that is my channel. If you'd like to have eternal life, will, knowledge, and eternal might, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links for my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!